The decision by the federal government had drawn criticism and support with uh, the likes of Ali Ndume, chief whip of the Senate, saying it will have political consequences. But also from the northern part of the country, Mohamed Sanusi, a former CBN governor, has said it was uh, a sensible move. Now, in a statement on Sunday, Idris said the allegations were unfounded, noting that the relocation is a practical step to improve the operational competence and reduce the cost of operation. Now, of course, uh, this is uh, the latest or one of the latest happenings in Nigeria. Now, joining me to make sense of this on the program is Biondo Shoumi, public affairs analyst, and also uh, Achike Chude, public affairs analyst, who will be joining, of course, in the point in the course of the program. But uh, thank you so much for your time, Biondo. Thank you for having me. I mean, interesting times, you say again, in Nigeria. This conversation started about a week ago uh, after the announcement by the federal government. Now, we've, of course, started seeing reactions. The likes of Ali Ndume, the chief whip of the Senate, saying that it would have political consequences. Also, we have uh, Mohamed Sanusi, the former CBN governor, saying that it was a sensible move. Now, what do you make of the plans of the Nigerian federal government to move certain departments of the CBN and also the uh, FAN, that's the aviation sector uh, headquarters, to Lagos? You see, we've all been complaining about the cost of um, running governments in Nigeria. And we've all been asking government to attend to it in different uh, ways, that, or one form or the other. Um, we have seen uh, the beginning of uh, genuine efforts to solve some of this problem. Uh, the other time we learned the president is cutting his um, entourage, I think, by 60% or something. And he applauded it. Now we have another major uh, decision being taken that will reduce the cost of government. For you to understand this issue, you need to really look at uh, the position of the CBN. The CBN headquarters was built, you know, with those departments in mind um, in Lagos. Um, at that time, the building was built, you know, to, so that um, they can have operational efficiency, be closer to the people they are supervising, and while at the same time um, not increasing the costs of um, supervision to the banks uh, one way or the other so that the banks won't end up passing it to the consumers you know to the customers who uh, will be at the losing end at the end of the day and but for some reasons uh, decisions were taken to move the banking supervision department and some other departments down uh, to abuja and uh, when that decision was taken the abuja building was just barely enough barely adequate to accommodate all the departments. So over a period of time, more staff were employed, and Abuja now became impossible in terms of space allocation. Um, so it then became difficult to accommodate all those departments in Abuja. That's one. Number two, if the banking regulator, uh, whoever heads the supervision departments, needs to see a bank uh, director or manager, one way or the other, they have to fly from Lagos to Abuja. All the bank's headquarters, apart from Jay's bank, are all in Lagos. So you can imagine the cost of running up and down, you know, the cost to their businesses, not being there to do every, any other thing. They will go, what should have been a kind of one hour uh, trip and meeting will end up becoming a two days um, business by simply by flying to Abuja. So it's quite very important to reduce all this. And I quite aligned with... Um, uh, with uh, Sanusi Lamido, uh, the former MA and former governor mm. of uh, Central Bank on this very issue. Then when you take the case of FAN, the case of FAN is even more ridiculous. You know, when, bearing in mind that about 70% of all the businesses of aviation is actually in Lagos. You know, both, whether you talk about the private charter, you talk about um, the international um, uh, uh, travel, or domestics, you know, most of them are in Lagos. So what is the sense in moving the supervisory department responsible, you know, uh, to supervise those airlines uh, performance and all that? Why are we moving them to Abuja? Why not allow them to stay in Lagos within five, 10 minutes of where those operations are based? Uh, that is uh, on one part. The other part of it is, it was just two years ago, 2022, you know, that they moved the Aviation, the fan staff, those departments down to Abuja. It was at the Sirica, the Minister for Aviation at the time, that ordered that move. Now, two years down the line, 
the FAN found itself paying the staff that were recruited to work in Lagos, who were relocated to Abuja, uh, they were seen as working out of station. And then that was costing FAN a lot of money. In addition to the fact that they are paying the cost of moving them to Abuja, while at the same time, those staff have no business in Abuja, they will still have to fly to Lagos, paid for by FAN again, to come and now supervise those airlines from where they were moved originally. It mm -hmm. just does not make sense. It, there is another one which they have not moved, which I hope uh, government will find the courage to do that because we are losing billions. Okay, you it, said there is one more you, you yes, hope they move, which, yes. which is which? Uh, which uh, is the simulator. We have only one simulator in Nigeria. The simulator is in a Civil Aviation College, okay. in um, National Civil Aviation College in Zaria. Now, we all know that most of the people that need this simulation, they need it every two months. Okay. Most of them, including international pilots, you know, are flying into Lagos. If you don't want to put it in Lagos, put it in Abuja. When they take it to, when it's in Zaria, most pilots, particularly foreign airline pilots and Nigerian pilots, they don't really want to go there because of the security situation. And because of that, they end up flying abroad to do this simulation test, which mm. they ordinarily could have done here because uh, we have the simulator in the country. All right, Biodo, we we'll, we'll come to that. I mean, that, that's another interesting perspective you, you're bringing to this uh, conversation too. Uh, but let's uh, listen to Achike Chude right now and hear his thoughts uh, firsthand on uh, this uh, decision by the federal government. Well, I, I don't think I, I have uh, much to add to what uh, Biodo has said. I think when you look at it administratively, it only makes sense to locate uh, these uh, uh, ministries of parastatus to Lagos, obviously, these institutions to Lagos. But beyond that is a fact, I want to look at the politics of it all. And that is that um, what it shows, is, so it, it is, it, this, this kind of uh, issue focuses once more on our fault lines, on the fact that uh, we have not uh, built a nation that works. And that is uh, responsible for every single thing that is being done by the government to be subject to be, I mean, to criticism and close scrutiny, because people are suspicious of every move that uh, government officials are take. You know, and uh, obviously uh, our politicians are so used to playing identity politics. And the purpose is not the love of their people because you see, look, what what the, the, the senators and those people who are talking, what they are trying to say is that we are there to protect our people, the interests of our people. But whose interests exactly? How do you, are you protecting the interests of your people? When, if you look at uh, the issue of governance in this country, for instance, one part of the country, the northern part of the country, has been in charge of governance in Nigeria for so long. And if you look at the outcome of this governance on their people, you know, it's, it's terrible. You are talking about economic disparities and poverty in the north. You are talking about, uh, you know, more out of school children in the north. You are talking about insecurity as the bane of the present day Nigeria. It's more in the north. And the insecurity that you are seeing in the south. It's as a result of the insecurity that was generated in the north, you know. And so, the question you ask yourself is, why would the north have been in power for so long, and yet, you know, their people, you know, are facing more poverty in terms of. I mean, if you look at the poverty record in the north, it's worse than the southern part of the country. So they have not done justice to their people, and so each time they bring up all of these issues, you know, you think. It's about protecting their people. It is not. It's about identity politics. Mm. And it makes them more popular before their people because they are seen as fighting for the interests of their people. Besides, there are those who are saying that, look, Abuja is supposed to be the center of national unity. You know, so why would you say claim that Abuja is in the north? If you look at it from you know that perspective, Abuja belongs to every single person, every one of us. You know, in the sense that I mean as Nigerians. We are not going to claim, we are not claiming the land. For instance, Nigerians from other parts of the country are not claiming the land in Abuja. But it is the center of unity. We know that there are people that are originally from Abuja and they remain people, you know, citizens, you know, of that place, the Gwaris and all that, you know. But then, you know, the way Abuja was, you know, uh, uh, carved out of uh, different states in the country was to give that impression of, you know, a uh, unity. And so when a matter comes up like this, an administrative matter for, for, you know, for, you know, that is now being made to look like an ethnic issue, it is exceedingly very, very 
unfortunate. But it is what our politicians have always done. You know, whether in, in, in politics, electoral politics, and so many other things, they use agenda politics uh, for the purpose of satiating certain primordial elitist interests. Mm. These interests are never, you know, the, in the interest of their people. And you also have certain politicians. So it's not just about northern politicians. We also have not certain politicians who jump on the bandwagon of identity politics to make the case you know, just because they want to be seen by their people as their champions, you know, but ultimately whatever comes from the center, from the federal government, you know, ends up in the pockets of these people and not in service of their people. So it is unfortunate. And that's why I said, look, I think Abiodo has, Abiodo has dispensed with the administrative side of it. And his positions, you know, are unassailable, really. But we also have to look at why these sentiments are being generated time and time again. Uh, I, I mean, talking about talking about the sentiments. I, I mean, Ali Ndume, for instance, uh, the chief of the Senate, you know, said that uh, the relocation of some of those offices or the move by the uh, federal government would have uh, political consequences. My emphasis would be, you know, on political consequences. However, the vice president, you know, at the tenth annual Saamadu Bello Memorial Lecture through. Is uh, through Akim Baba Ahmed, his special advice on political matters, actually said, and I quote, recently there were those opposing the federal government's decision over planned relocation of some departments and units of the Central Bank of Nigeria and also the FAN from Abuja to Lagos. I want to reassure the people of the North that the move is for the interest of the generality of Nigerians. I want to come to you, Biodun. This is the position of the vice president, who is also from that region, by the way. And uh, we also seen another, uh, well, I call it stakeholder, uh, of course, uh, in the northern region, talking about Ali Ndume, who is talking about political consequences. Now, uh, what do you make of this? Uh, and how uh, is there, in, in, uh, I mean, talking about political consequences, what are we looking at here? You see, Atike mentioned the issue of identity politics. Ali Indume is well known to everybody. We know why he's doing what he's doing. Um, he felt there's a need to actually uh, threaten the president of the country with political consequences. Threaten? For, yeah, it's a threat that, look, mm. if you do this, there'll be political consequences. That's a threat. It's a subtle threat. So in my view, um, I think he's only playing the game which he knows how best to play. But that does, his views does not really represent, you know, the views of most members of the Senate, even most members of the Senate from the North. You know, that issue needs to be stressed. The fact of the matter is every state in the Federation has a CBN branch. And if, for the sake of efficiency, there's a need to move one branch to the other, why not do so? After all, the governor of Central Bank is there. The inland, National Inland Water, Waterways Authority's headquarters is in Lagos. You cannot go and put the headquarters of a National Inland Waterways or Nigerian Port Authority. You can't go and put that in Katsina or in Maiduguri, where all the services are farther away from them. So it's always logical, and that is common sense approach, and is in, in line with global standards and practice that supervisory bodies need to be closer to those who they are supervising. So if Ali Indume, because of that, keeps, um, uh, keeps issuing the kind of threats which I felt he issued, um, I think um, he's not going to hold water. There are so many people in the Senate, so many people in the North, who will not share his viewpoint on mm. this very matter. Mm. I, I would like to go to you, Achike. I mean, what do you make of that word, political consequences, and also the stand of the Vice President? And also the fact that some people are also questioning the legality and the constitutionality, you know, of that of the move uh, by the government. Let's even dispense with the last. If they are questioning the legality, I mean, you're you're talking about a president that has the presidential powers, a president that appoints uh, ministers, and uh, if he appoints ministers, and then the ministers cannot on their own uh, decide how they are going to function as ministers. They cannot decide, uh, you know, uh, make decisions about how to, you know, where to locate uh, or site uh, departments, uh, you know, ministry or, or agencies of the ministry under under their control. 
in, in particular areas for the purpose of uh, efficiency that they cannot do that, that it's illegal. Well, I mean, there's always um, uh, uh, the court for them to, you know, resort to, so they can go to court uh, uh, if they want. Uh, but with regards to the politics of it all, um, uh, obviously, um, again, it's talk, obviously, it's talking about uh, what will likely happen in 2027. Mm. I'm not sure that uh, the North is going to make a move against uh, uh, Bola Metinubu on the basis of this particular on the basis of this particular action, you know, but what what I think is that perhaps they will be looking at what they are just doing is just to racket up uh, the pressure. Uh, perhaps uh, there are other expectations uh, from the from the president, or they might have from the president, you know. So uh, this is just uh, you know one way of telling the president that we are watching you, and then even if you get away with this, we want to see whether you have the guts to do some other things that we perceive to be against uh, the interests of the north. And that once you do all of those things, remember that you are in a position to affect your ambition in 2027 uh, in ways that you would not like. And so I think that that's what this whole thing is all about. I think it's also a blackmail, really, if you ask me, uh, you know, um, uh, so that uh, he doesn't uh, make moves that some of them we see as detrimental to their own interests. And I have said, there's nothing like the elites. The elites do not believe in the interests of the North. When they are talking about the interests of the North, they are talking about their own interest, uh, you know, and uh, so not an interest becomes their own interest. The same thing, you know, certain interests will become the interest of some people, you know, from the South, but they aggregate it as the interest of the entire people of uh, the South. And we know that our political class is very selfish and self-centered. They think of themselves all the time. It's never about the people of the North. So those who said it is going to affect the North have not proven to us, have not shown us how you know, moving the Central Bank of Nigeria and the FAN to Lagos, how it will impact on the people of the North, on the ordinary people in the North, you know? So it's it's some of this um, uh, 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 kind of behavior that they have gotten away with all over, I mean, all, all down the years, whether Southern political leaders or Northern political leaders. And I think it is time at the begin to call these people out, to mm -hmm. call them out for their blackmail and let them do their job. They are senators, let them go and do their job. There are too many things that are going wrong in the country. There is insecurity and so many other deficits in Nigeria. These are the things we expect that they will focus their attention on and not on this uh, parochial, you know, primordial uh, identity, ethnic based uh, politics. It will not take the country anywhere. Okay. Uh, let's also look at the direct impact on a place like Lagos, for instance. Uh, Lagos is, of course, the commercial hub of the country, but at the same time, you would also agree that Lagos has, uh, well, I call it a population issue. I mean, in terms of uh, the influx of people who come into Lagos daily, you would agree that uh, it's pretty massive. And that has put a lot of pressure on the existing resources. Some are even of the opinion that when it comes to uh, basic needs like accommodation in Lagos, for instance, it's almost, uh, I don't want to use the word unaffordable, but it's, uh, it's Cutthroat. Now, introducing this kind of initiatives further puts a lot of further pressure, you know, on Lagos State. Do, do you think uh, that is the case uh, with uh, this move, Biodo? Well, I don't really um, think so, uh, given the fact that the number of staff we are talking about. Are we talking about twenty thousand staff? No, we are not talking about ten thousand staff. We know how many people enter. Lagos on a daily basis. And most of those people entering Lagos on a daily basis, you know, the internal um, migrant, um, you realize that, um, I'm sorry I use the word migrant, the, uh, how do I put it? People are moving into Lagos, you know, um, in, in search of greener pastures, you know, um, you realize that there are quite a lot of people, you know, moving in, maybe a thousand a day and all that, with no place to go, no means of income, nothing, no money to hire any property and then one way or the other manage to exist. There are properties in Lagos which are still begging, you know, for tenants, um, uh, partly due to the cost, partly due to those um, who need houses cannot afford them. So, but I don't think this will affect uh, this stuff. Don't forget that some of these um, organizations, some of these um, government departments like um, FAN and CBN, they have their staff quarters, you know, they have properties here and there which um, were vacated when, in the case of FAN, when Adisirika moved them about two years ago. Even some of those staff have their families in Lagos. 
they still like keep another accommodation in Lagos because they are seen to be working outside, out of station. Their main station is still Lagos. So they are being paid a stack code for being there, which is costing government a lot of money. So government would rather save money if they are moved back. Fan will save money if they are moved back to Lagos. So I cannot see how the population of Lagos will affect it. Population of Lagos will never stop people from flying in or flying out or mm. businesses moving into Lagos, new businesses springing up. Uh, they will, that will continue to happen one way or the other because uh, Lagos will keep expanding. Mm. We have had, um, uh, you know, even businesses moving out of Lagos and new ones moving into Lagos. So that's likely going to be the pattern. I cannot see that population affecting those um, uh, uh, already resident in Lagos. I think we should uh, take uh, Achike's uh, opinion on this, but uh, I would also like to add a bit to that. There's also the talk that, I mean, the world is going smart. As against moving physical offices, we are beginning to see people work virtually. And that some of this uh, administrative, well, I call it convenience, you know, as excuse that the government has given, uh, most of these things can be done virtually. You can send mails. You can, uh, you can of course, uh, have virtual meetings. Like I'm talking with you right now, Achike, from wherever you are you know, in the country. Those are alternatives as against moving physical offices. That is the argument of some people. And some have also argued that, yeah. I mean, if you are talking about proximity and in terms of administrative functionality, then ministries like the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment should be in the East because you have a lot of... <laughs> of, uh, well, I call it, local manufacturing industries there. So I would like to know your reaction. Look, this is, this is not about equity. Because, mm. for instance, if you say, look, yeah, that you are talking to me virtually right now, that's the truth. This is an alternative. But what is the best, the, the best uh, position, the best situation should be that I'll be in your studio. Because if I'm in, I'm in your studio, there are certain things you know, the interview is more likely going to go even much better because you are going to be able to assess me physically. I mean, close up, you know, my gestures and all that. And I would also be able to also do the same thing. So it's not exactly the same. If, if uh, you know, virtual and, you know, being, uh, uh, you know, present in a particular meet, you know, uh, meeting or discussion, not exactly the same thing. Virtual is just an alternative to some mm. extent, maybe a poor alternative uh, to the real thing. You know, but the, the reality is that, um, you know, people who are making the argument, hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah. Because the people who are making the argument, you know, about, uh, well, Ministry of Trade and Industry should be cited in the in the East and so on, are now beginning to make, uh, you know, fun of it, you know, to make a joke out of, out of the whole thing. This is a serious matter, you know, and uh, the reality is that uh, even everybody is now talking about AI and the fear that AI is going to take over some human jobs. But there are certain jobs that the AI can never replace. The AI can never do the job of a bricklayer or a painter and some of these other things too. So we know. So there is a limit to what technology can do. Human hands and human intervention must always will always be necessary in, in certain things. You know, and so it depends on the nature of the job that the people at FAN and uh, and then um, you know CBN would be doing. Perhaps the, 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 the managers have discovered that this particular job are not jobs that can be done virtually. You know, and that's why they have decided that there must be in-person engagement, you know, with these workers. You know, and, and so, uh, um, um, obviously, uh, there are some things that can, like I said, that can be done virtually. There are some things that cannot be done virtually. And so this particular job that uh, the, the, the CBN and the FN requires, their staff to do at things I'm sure that they cannot do, you know, virtually. So it's not an argument that anybody, you know, should uh, should use that the minister of uh, industry should go uh, down to the east because you have more people engaging in manual labor and industries and the rest. That's not the issue. If it becomes if it becomes necessary, then I believe that the government will move those things uh, to those particular places. After all, some of them have their own offices. Mm. you know, where they can also interact easily with people from those places. It is not as if government ministries are not represented in many parts of the country. In fact, there is no part of the country, for instance, where you will not find certain ministries, you know, agencies of ministries being represented, perhaps not in the volume, you know, or level that one expects, but you have some, you know, representation in those other places. So I think that really this is what, you know, the, the argument, uh, you know, uh, should be or should not be. 
Uh, if, you, if you permit me okay, to add please, to it, uh, if you permit me to add to it, okay. the nature of the services that will be rendered by CBM banking supervision regulator cannot be done virtually because they have to examine papers inside those bank headquarters. This cannot be done virtually. Otherwise, the banks would shortchange the CBN in terms of uh, on his um, um, reportorial duty. And so they have to check every single thing, check for infractions. This cannot be done virtually. In the same way, we all know the aviation sector, it's a very highly technical uh, sector. We have heard of near misses of um, plane uh, incidents. Fortunately, we've not had an accident in recent times. Nobody wants an accident because the consequences of trying to supervise airline, both private and um, uh, commercial. Uh, commercial airlines, virtually, will be too risky. Nobody will want to take such a risk because we'll be dealing with 150, 200 people inside the plane, putting their lives at risk simply because we want to do them virtually. Those are the departments where they are moving in charge of direct supervision of those um, businesses. So therefore, and it's not a question of whether they are moving the headquarters. No, they are only moving the department responsible for regulatory supervision closer to where the businesses to be, you know, regulated are, to be supervised. Are. And that's uh, the situation on this matter. All right, Bildon, I'd like to stay with you on this. Now, uh, there are fears by some, particularly who, you know, against this move that this might just be a precursor to a major game changer, and that is moving the uh, capital of Nigeria from Abuja back to Lagos State. Do you see this happening? No. The reason is um, Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, is created by law. And in order to abrogate that law, you need to third of the National Assembly to agree to it. And because it will involve a major change to the condition of the country, you need to take it you know, to all the houses of assembly and to third again agreeing to it of the state houses of assembly. So I cannot see that happening. You know, Abuja is there, it has come to stay. They cannot move Abuja back to Lagos. It's almost impossible, even if that is what Nigerians uh, want. As Lagos as it is currently, it's so congested with um, businesses and other things. We need to ensure that we're able to build a country where we have combined and even development. Development needs to spread beyond certain areas in Nigeria. Otherwise, you continue to have Nigerians streaming to Lagos, you know, in order to try and find a living. We need to ensure that other places are also developed. Let me give you a good example. Eighty percent of all industries in Nigeria are between Lagos and Ogun State. How can that be right um, in a country like ours? We need to create the conducive environment for businesses to invest in other places. So. Come, everybody coming to Lagos or going to Abeokuta or Ogun State is not a solution to it. What we need to do is to do the right thing. Let me give you a good example. United Kingdom. Some years ago, about um, roughly 20, 22 years ago, okay. the UK was feeling the pressure of um, people moving into London. Mm -hmm. And they have to, what we call federal ministry, they call them departments. They have to relocate some of the departments out of London. Okay. Some to Birmingham, some to Manchester, and different places. Mm. So these are routine things. So I cannot see how the whole Abuja again will be dissolved into Lagos. All right. That's not likely going to happen. All right, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. Biodun Shoumi, public affairs analyst, and Achike Chude, public affairs analyst from Lagos, Nigeria. Once again, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Kenya's High Court has ruled against a government plan to deploy hundreds of police officers to Haiti to lead a United Nations backed multinational mission to fight escalating gang violence in the Caribbean country. Now, Enoch Chacha Wita, the George, who issued the ruling, said any decision by any state organ or state officer to deploy police officers to AET contravenes the constitution and the law and is therefore unconstitutional, illegal and invalid. Joining me on the program is Chris Oteno, uh, that CEO and lead consultant set uh, East Africa Limited from Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you so much for your time, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. All right, great. Now, let me start uh, by quoting the George, who said that any decision 
by the state organ or state official uh, to deploy police officers to Haiti contravenes the constitution and the law and is therefore unconstitutional, illegal and invalid. Can you give us some legal insight to this workings? Uh, thank you very much. If we look at where this matter has come from, it has been quite a long process. It started a long time ago with the, with the, with the United Nations Security Council. Uh, Haiti government putting up a plea at the United Nations Security Council, asked for international intervention. And thereafter, our president showed up, uh, gave, uh, gave, a, gave, a, gave us talk at uh, the 38th annual gathering of, of, of the United Nations Security Council and put forth that Kenya was really, the matter had been dragged because there was lack of a leading nation for this multinational support, security support, for, uh, support, support mission. Now, that was uh, looked at differently by a number of persons in our country, and one of our gentlemen, known as Ekuru Aukot, filed a private lawsuit uh, together with two other parties, a political party, one and the second petition of being uh, Muru Aurelo, and they said it is unconstitutional. And in their argument, they had several demands. And like you well put it, the first demand was that the court of law puts a declaration that the act of deploying police officers to Haiti is unconstitutional, illegal, and void. And they quoted a number of, uh, a number of sections of, of our constitution, which I'm shortly going to give you. All right? And the other line, item number two, was a declaration that police officers cannot be deployed outside of Kenya. Right? And the, the, the third one, uh, that sections 107 of our constitution, 108 of our constitution, and 109 of the police service act provides for deployment of security service under reciprocal arrangements with the reciprocating countries all right which are are, are under articles 240 subsection 8 and 243 uh subsection 3 of our constitution and this provides that it is only kenya defense forces that can be deployed out of kenya and not the national police, because the national police is looked as, as a national service which can only be deployed within the boundaries or the confines of, 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 our, of our Kenyan boundaries, right? And they can function throughout Kenya. So it is on this basis that this private lawsuit uh, was taken before a court of law and disposals subsequent from arguments or presentations in court uh, were given by that judge, that the court of the uh, judge of the high court. Mm. Now let's also even look at it uh, practically. Now, would you say, I mean, should this proposal, for instance, choose to sell, just you know, given you know an uh, utopian uh, perspective to it, does Kenya actually have the capacity to uh, sustain you know its police force internally and externally? Should it you know go for uh, the, a decision like this? Internally, we are able to sustain our police force. And externally, we will work with partners. Can you just give us an I idea mean, roughly? Sorry. Can you give us an idea, you know, the size of the police force in Kenya uh, to, I mean, how many uh, police officers, for instance, are responsible to how many citizens? So one can have an idea of how strong, you know, the policing system is in Kenya. The United Nations provide that the best rational, ration for, uh, ratio for police, uh, police force would be one police officer to 400 citizens. But we're seeing that currently we are working with a ratio of one police officer to, to, to 800 Kenyan citizens, almost double the UN provision. Hmm. So, so do you think that uh, the country has the capacity to actually sustain such a you know, move, particularly externally? I would say externally we will work with partners because the amount that I'm involved with are not small amounts. The last time I checked the amount, the whole of this operation or the whole of this exercise in, in, in Haiti would take 90 billion Kenyan shillings, which if you convert in dollars, requires to divide that by 160, which is all other billions of, 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 I mean, millions of US dollars. That is an amount which I think our country cannot support. And that is why we are going through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, working with other international players to support this course that Kenya has offered to lead international security support mission in Haiti. And we know that the Prime Minister of Haiti was here in Kenya and put, off, put, put forward a case. And that case was accepted by the President of this nation. And, we, uh, and that was passed by Parliament that the Kenya shall offer that outside of the country. So with that kind of a support, then we are ready 
as a nation to send a thousand police officers to maintain law and order in this country of Haiti, which requires a lot of uh, a lot of support from humanitarian actions, from the security, and the collapsed political system that is currently in that country. Now, the the president of Kenya, that's a William Ruto, has actually called or branded the mission as a mission for humanity. Now, do you think the president is actually doing this from you know, uh, will I call it a human standpoint or just to make a political statement on the global stage? There are three perspectives that we can look at this from. And I'm, mm. I'm, I'm actually happy that you want us to go directly to, 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 to what we think the president is thinking. I am thinking, number one, that our president wants to bring the Kenyan, uh, K K K Kenyan country into the global limelight. We have also gone many times outside of our nation to support UN missions, for example, in Croatia, for example, in Namibia, and for example, in Somalia. Yeah? So I think this is from uh, the point of our country being able to support this kind of mission, not from an individual, not from other perspective, but that would require more explorations. But what I think from where I'm sitting as a political, as a, as a security expert, that this is being done on the basis of a UN Security Council decision uh, to support Haiti, for this collapsed political system, for the security requirements, and all that has resulted into a, a crisis of, 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 of a humanitarian, uh, brought about humanitarian crisis that is really of a huge magnitude. For example, you can think of the number of persons losing their life in Haiti equates two persons every two hours, which is pretty high. 5,000 persons in that particular, in one year, that, that is quite a high number of, 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 of persons to lose their life because of the insecure situation that is in that country. So I think, and I know, that yes, we are going out there as Kenya to support the humanitarian action that is outside of our country and to help our brothers in Haiti who have called for international support. Mm. Now, the, uh, Isaac uh, Waura, that's a spokesperson for the Kenyan government, actually said on Friday that the decision by the High Court will be contested legally. What do you see as an eventual outcome? Our, our cabinet sector interior uh, responded to, to what has had been filed in this private lawsuit, and he brought some very good points uh, to support uh, the fact that this one needs to be quashed and, and, and a different look needs to be brought into this. So soon as that is filed, I think and, and I foresee a situation where our courts are going to stick to their guns or say this is not constitutional, and the executive arm of government is going to say this is a, this is this is a constitutional, and we are going to go right right with it because our parliament, which are, is a group of lawmakers, has already approved this and said yes, we can go ahead and provide this uh, this this missions uh, lead, leadership in this mission uh, requirement in Haiti. Mm. Now I, I want to give you some sort of uh, uh, idea of what uh, the Kenyan police, you know, might face should this uh, decision be contested and eventually maybe the government gets a go-ahead. We know that uh, the major issue right now in Haiti is gang-related violence. And it's so bad that it led to the assassination of President uh, Jovenel Moïse uh, almost three years ago. Now, between January alone and September 2023, Haiti has recorded over 3,000 homicide cases and more than 1,500 kidnappings for ransom. That's according to the United Nations. Now, looking at the training and the capacity of the Kenyan police, an average Kenyan police officer, do you think they have what it takes to face uh, the gangs of Haiti? I don't know the kind of weaponry, and from what the UN has given the report on Haiti, the kind of weaponry that the gangs are having there, they are weapons of really high caliber, weapons of high sophistication. If you compare that to what we have, we can say there's a complete mismatch. We could be several degrees down uh, the line on what we have and what they are having. Now, what I'm saying is going to be the intervention to support this Kenyan uh, leadership in this, this security mission. We are saying that the government of the United States has said that it's going to support this mission logistically, not personal-wise, not, not personnel. No person is going to step on, on the Haitian the, on, on the ground from, from the U.S., but the Kenyan government, I mean, our Kenyan police are going to step there. So we know and they have been trained to be aware of the high level of risk that they are going to face. And the fact that there are so many warnings that have been sent by the net uh, by these guns in Haiti. And they are saying, we are waiting for you. And we know because of this kind of threat analysis and risks that are, are there in Haiti, our forces have been prepared 
to be able to face these risks and to be able to mitigate them as much as is possible. But we know for fact that is not going to be a walk in the park when our people get to Haiti. It's not going to be a walk in the park. They are determined and they've been doing this for a very long time and they know how it has gone and they're ready to really make sure that these international forces are faced their wrath when they get outside of their borders and set foot in Haiti. We are fully aware of that. Mm. Now, I mean, looking at reactions also from Kenyans, as some are in support of uh, this move, uh, quite a number are also kicking against it, saying that this shouldn't be even a priority, you know, of the president. It shouldn't even occur on the list. We know that right now there's the inflation, there's the economy issue, you know, in Kenya. There's also the tax issue where even on uh, housing, you know, uh, and also accommodation, uh, there's uh, a lot of back and forth as regards taxation. So there are, there are quite a number of naughty areas that they feel that the president should focus his energy and attention on. Do you also think in that direction too? Like you rightfully said, the country is very split, almost half-half, uh, quarter, quarter, three quarter, and things like that. There are some who say we cannot sustain this. There are some who say we can sustain this. From my professional city, I think it would rather be nice and good to say that we focus our attention on our national issues. We have a lot of issues going on in our country. We have banditry somewhere in northeastern Kenya that requires the attention of both police and national intelligence service and, and national defense and Kenya defense forces. All right. But we are saying that Haitians are our brothers. And they have pleaded in the UN General Assembly. Their prime minister has visited our country and put forward a plea. Can I have a hand of a helping brother? All right. That is something that we need to look at from a humanitarian perspective and say, let's keep part of our force to go take care of that. And let's also, let's also give other resources from within the resources that we have. Allocate other resources that can address our national issues. Of course, that becomes a priority, not the Haitian, not the Haitian matter. But the Kenyan insecurity cases, Kenyan national security requirements becomes a priority. And I think that should be a real big focus, to focus ourselves on ensuring that Kenya itself is secure and safe, to allow businesses to flourish, to allow the common citizens to go on with their business rightfully done. My thought. All right. Now, uh, just before, of course, I let you go, I would like to know your take on what you think uh, this move would have on the sub-region. Uh, talking about uh, cascading effects, do we see a situation whereby quite a number of African countries would uh, maybe in turn follow suit and decide to, of course, uh, 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 support Kenya or go in the way Kenya is going when it comes to supporting uh, a country with uh, its uh, defense forces? Yes, there are a number of African countries which have joined Kenya. I've let Kenya lead this direction in Haiti. And I would like to mention Chad. Chad is in there and other countries are also in there. right? So we are saying this could be a precedent for African countries to deploy their security forces to serve outside of, of, of the African borders and also the national borders. And, and this would be something we say, all right, the risk could be very high. But it also exposes our security forces to the kind of risks that are out there. And that will translate into us preparing ourselves for those kinds of risks, meaning that we will advance, for example, in terms of how we the tactics uh, we, we use in handling uh, this kind of situation, the kind of people that come into our country. And of course, we'll improve our international collaboration in terms of fighting uh, organized crimes and fighting these kinds of, of, of crimes that are of national, uh, national, national, national and international levels. So I am for the fact that, yes, we need to go out there and do this kind of jobs. And as many African countries should also come in and support this kind of a cause. Knowing very well that whatever the outcome would be, it's not that we want to send our forces out there to lose their lives or to create, as, uh, to create a high number of fatality, but we are saying that we must also render service to international partners who need our help. And when that, ha that help is asked, then we should be able to deploy a multi-skilled force, a, a multi-unit multi force, to go out there and be able to give that help in that is required in that international arena by, by, by that particular country that has forwarded its request to the UN General Assembly and approved through the constitutional requirements of any African country that is here. All right. So are you saying this particular move would uh, impact positively on the president's uh, political uh, future and also legacy locally? Internationally, we will, the president is going to create a huge uh, 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 international approval. We have seen countries like the U.S., how they approve this move, and how they volunteer to support this mission. We have seen France also going in there, and Germany also going in there. So internationally, 
it places our country or the country that will take this lead at, 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 at a high at a high step. But when you come locally, we are saying that with our internal problems, with our internal insecurities, right? We would look at it different and say, why are we deploying our fellow countrymen to go and take care of other problems outside of our borders? What else? We have same same security and safety problems domiciled in our country that still require a number of our, our uniformed persons to go and take care of. Mm. That would be very, it would be very split, depending on what direction or what angle we look at it. All right, uh, Chris Othiano, that's a CEO and uh, lead consultant, State East Africa Limited, uh, all the way from Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me.